Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mr. Karan Butler. Here you are, Khan, sir. Here you go, take a seat right there. How y'all doing? Cool, cool, cool. I gotta say, it must never get old hearing your resume when it includes stuff like that, right? That's a pretty sweet resume. It, it's unreal, like to, like, so I just got off a flight from California, that's where I stay. Got here about six in the morning, and then I come here, and I'm thinking about UConn and my memories of playing at Connecticut. And then this is my first time ever in this building. And I'm looking at all the legends, Nancy Lieberman, Jason Kidd, Steve Nash. Uh, so many have been my former teammates, but just, I'm still in awe. Sue Bird, I'm looking at her, my former coach, Jim Calhoun. It's just, it's amazing. It's, feels good. It feels I love good. hearing that. I, I, in many ways, I feel like I have the best job in the world because I get to watch men and women like you who have played in so many years in the league and still get chills. Uh, it, might, it might be because Coach Calhoun's still staring at you all these years later. Yeah, it, it, like he's smiling <laughs> now, but he's usually yelling at me. <laughs> <laughs> Always yelling at me about taking a bad shot or out of rhythm or out of flow, but yeah, it's crazy. So, uh, Karan, I want to your your journey, and and I want to go chronologically because your journey is one um, that not enough people have heard. Um, it is in some ways um, is bigger than basketball, but in other ways sort of hinges on basketball to happen. And so I want to ask you, looking at young Karan Butler in Racine, Wisconsin, um, and the choices that you were making in your early teenage years. How is it that we get from Karan Butler, age 13, making all the wrong decisions, to the Karan Butler that is then in position to go to a great prep school in Maine and then eventually play at UConn? Look, it, it really was a divine intervention. Um, I was raised by strong women. I did not have a father figure in my life growing up. No reason for me to veer off into the wrong path that I did. Went through a lot of adversity at an early age growing up. Not to, you know, scare any of you, any of you that's listening, but, you know, I was incarcerated, uh, spent some time in corrections, and then when I got out, you know, basketball really saved my life. It was a vehicle for me to do other things and took me away from the streets. It took me away from the environments of seeing all the things that was my reality at the time. So I, I was what I was exposed to. I started seeing different things, uh, start playing basketball, traveling, seeing the world, getting outside of a six mile radius of Racine, Wisconsin, just north of Chicago. And I was exposed to much different things and I started believing that I can be anything, I can do anything. I started seeing people that look like me doing successful things in life. And I was like, man, I can, I, can, I can play basketball. I possibly can go pro. I can go to school. I can go to college. I can be productive in life. And that's the things that happened for me. Karan, what was the decision like to go from um, the Midwest to Maine, um, to, to Maine, Maine Central Institute? Are, because some of the people who have made the decisions that you had made at that point in your life don't, don't get that opportunity to then choose not only to get out of the lifestyle, but to go so far away and hit the reset button. So what was that decision-making process like for you? It, that, that was the toughest decision for me in my life to go to prep school, right? Because I'm accustomed to being accustomed. You know, I, like I said, I was raised by women, strong women. And for them to take a chance to send me somewhere where they didn't know whether I was going to get you know, um, taken care of on a day to day. They knew that the school was legit, but like, who's gonna feed my baby, my, my, my big mama, my grandmother, like, who's gonna take care of my grandson while he's at school and provide for him and make sure that he have all the necessary things away from the, the, the prep school. So it was a huge gamble in the decision uh, by my family, but we try to break the generational curse. We yeah. try to try something new. We come from the South. My family grew up on the cotton fields. They picked cotton for 20 cents a day. And, you know, that was a huge adjustment for us coming up north 
to being on the assembly lines and factories at J.I. Case. And now this was another big adjustment for me going to prep school and, you know, putting my best foot forward. And you know, so much of this stuff is covered in that incredible book that you had the courage to write, Tough Juice, which we'll talk about in a little while, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how, what kind of decision does it make, it, does, does Karan Butler have to make to make your book, your memoir, so, so ferociously personal? That, that book, um, uh, as, as the father of a child of color, that book, that book really um, sh uh, changed the way that I, that, that I parent a little bit. And, and it, because it was so ferociously personal, was that, a, was that a, 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 a conscious decision that you had to make to not hold anything back in that book? Yeah, it was, it was therapy, it was therapeutic. Like, so whenever you write something or you, you do uh, deals with like literature agents and, 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 and any agent, you know, they're gonna try to filter your reality as much as possible. And one of the things that I wanted to do was be authentic through and through. Yeah. I didn't want anything to change. I didn't want to, because that's not what I come from. Like, sure. I didn't want to, if, if drugs was the issue, we're talking about drugs. Sure. If uh, this was the issue, we're talking about this. Whatever the issue was that I went through, yeah. we're talking about it. Sure. Because that was my reality, and I didn't want to water it down. And I wanted that information to be visible to all of you that's coming up because we all have our own personal struggles. And you may think that no one else out there is going through your struggles because no one is telling the real story of their reality. So that's why I just said, look, we're going to say what it is. Let right. the chips fall where it may. And someone who recognized that you were who you were and the chips were going to fall, but he also appreciated who Karan Butler was, was, of course, Coach Jim Calhoun. So somewhere along the line in this magnificent journey of yours, Coach Jim Calhoun comes into your life and the recruitment starts. So we know how it ends with the Elite Eight, with the top 10 draft pick status. But how did it begin? What was Coach Calhoun's first contact with you like? It, it was amazing because I'll never forget, I was at an AAU tournament with a traveling team, and I, I had the luxury of traveling this time because I couldn't leave out my state. As I told you, I was going through a lot of stuff early in my life. And uh, my parole officer at the time let me go with the traveling team, and I traveled, and I I ran into this guy, Jim Calhoun, and he saw me on this platform, and he was just like, wow. He was like, kid, you got a lot of talent, and you know, it was during the period where you couldn't really talk to the players, so he was just like, I got my eye on you, you know? And Jim Calhoun, I gotta fast forward a little bit. Jim Calhoun came to the south side of Racine, Wisconsin. <laughs> I wouldn't go there without security. <laughs> Jim Calhoun came to the south side of Racine, <laughs> Wisconsin, and came to my neighborhood community center and just, just watched me and interacted with me and told my family, like, look, if he come to the University of Connecticut, he's going to be family for life. We're going to make sure that he's uh, a better version of himself and everything that he committed to saying and doing that day, it happened. And Storrs, Connecticut feels a little different than the south side of Racine, doesn't it? Yeah, it's safe. <laughs> <laughs> it's very safe out here. Very. Now, at UConn, obviously, like we said, your two years were just you know, filled with success. You were filling the stat sheet in the Big East. We could talk for hours about the Big East, how much I love the I Big East. I miss the old Big East. Me too. This is proof that Syracuse guys and UConn guys can sit together. I just want. We could get along again. We can do this. Yes, <laughs> finally. <laughs> what was it about... Coach Calhoun's system and the Big East at the time, uh, that, you know, I mean, it was a you know, fantastic league. We're talking about, you know, Carmelo and you, and I mean, it, it was unreal. That allowed Karan Butler's game to shine. What was it? I, I, I think so many guys, like, I, I see so many young boys and girls that you work on certain aspects of your game and your craft, right? So if you're dribbling around cones and you're playing against ghosts or whatever, but you develop a, a niche that you're great at or what you're really good at. And what I was good at was pace, the flow of the game, yeah. getting up and down. And UConn was all about pace at the time. It was all about flow. And Jim Calhoun put me in a situation where if I get the rebound, I can use my versatility and bring the basketball up. Uh, letting me be a roamer. And what I mean by a roamer on the court is setting random pick and rolls and just going to find action where I can facilitate and get the basketball back in my hand. And 
that's exactly what he provided for me. That's the space that he promised me, you know, during uh, our recruiting period. And everything happened just the way he spoke it. After your sophomore year, uh, you make the decision to declare for the NBA draft, and it goes really well. Uh, number 10 draft pick to the Miami Heat. We'll talk about the way that the Heat really let you just play. But first, I want to hear, and I'm always fascinated by draft day stories, because everyone's story is so unique. It really says a lot about a person's personality, the way that they prepare for the draft, whether they were wearing a, a line in the carpet that, that morning. What was your draft day like? My draft day was busy because it was the probably the third time that I had to put on a suit in my life. You know, um, growing up in racing, like I said, every Sunday you go to church as is. So, you know, sometimes I just wear my white T-shirts, my jeans, whatever the case, you know. And But this was a special moment. I wanted to look my best. It was national television. I wanted to be a better version of myself. And also, just this crowd right here, that's what my, my, my draft day room looked like. I had all family members. I had new cousins. I had some more <laughs> new cousins and my second cousins and my god cousins because, you know, everybody knew that I was about to hit, hit, hit the jackpot. So it was just a new look, you know, and it was amazing feeling, though. It was good to be celebrated in that, in that, in that form. Nothing quite like new cousins. And none like my third and fourth cousins. <laughs> Ain't nothing like it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the moment that I really love because I only have four more questions for Karan Butler, but after this next question, I am going to ask a few of you to volunteer a question for Mr. Karan Butler. So if you've ever wanted to ask him a question, this will be your chance today. One of the great Hoopal staffers will swing around and select a handful of you, and you will have that opportunity. So start to stew. What am I leaving out on the table? What have you always wanted to ask uh, one of your favorite players of all time? So once in Miami, there was little time for you to sit and learn. Um, you were thrown right in and, and allowed to, I mean, on a team that needed someone Score. to do a lot of scoring. Um, and I have to think that going from Coach Calhoun to Coach Pat Riley was like, uh, I don't know, cooking with gas and then going to more gas? <laughs> Can you talk about that? It, Calhoun prepared me for being a professional on and off the court. Sure. Because all of you will soon learn that if you want to play basketball or whatever sport or whatever you want to do in life, like sports is a reflection of life. You have to be consistent. You, your preparation is so important. And no one is more detailed than the godfather of the game in Pat Riley. Like, he's so dialed into detail. He takes film so extreme to the next level. It's like, did you see that guy cut? I'm like, yeah, but why did he cut? Huh. I'm like, because he cut. Yeah. I don't know. Like, he cut. He was open. He was like, no, you missing. He cut because he went through that gave him space. Like, it's just a whole nother level of thinking. And once I started thinking like that, it was, the, it was the reason why I was able to have longevity in this space because I knew the game. I saw the game differently, and I was able to play with some of the greatest players because of that time in Miami with Pat Riley. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that explanation. Pat Riley is, I don't think, gets, an, because of how he presents on the sideline, it's that back room stuff that no one, people don't talk about enough, right? Second to none. And, and listen, just, you know, we're, we're in the, the library of basketball. Yeah. And you cannot tell the story of basketball without talking about the legendary Pat Riley. And I had the luxury of just having him in my life at an early age. You know, you're talking about a 19-year-old, 20-year-old coming fresh out of college, uh, not a wealth of knowledge from a basketball standpoint. I just knew how to go hard. Uh -huh. Like they say, what, how, how do you play? I, I play hard. Like, right. why, what, I play hard. Right, right. But like it was, it's a method and a reason to it. And he taught me the education and, and the science behind why you should play hard but play smart. I'm wondering then how, um, and I promise I'll get to you, I'm wondering how that then translates into one year later when Pat Riley trades you along with um, a few other dudes on the team in that that deal that to, to Los Angeles, to the Lakers, and the deal that everyone remembers that brings Shaq back to Miami. Was that a little, well, how does young Karan Butler respond to his first trade? <laughs> kind of like a young DeMar DeRozan just responded, <laughs> and a young everybody. You know, like, I, I was in Antigua. This, this is, y'all really need to hear this story. I was in Antigua on an island doing a basketball without borders trip. 
for the Miami Heat. Oof. You get this? Yeah. I'm, I'm working for the Miami Heat in my time. This is summer. It's my time. I'm doing the clinic, and I come back, and this is where ESPN got the stroller going through, and I'm looking, and they said, Shaquille O'Neal coming to the Miami Heat. I'm like, yo, Shaq, yo, I'm about to play with Shaq. He coming to Miami Heat. Traded. Karan Butler, Brian Grant. I said, well, I'm Karan Butler. I'm <laughs> I said, I said this, and this is when we had the flip phone, so, you know, it's not the information, you know, it's not like Bleacher Report or something. So I'm calling my agent and, you know, going through all this stuff, and they're like, yeah, you, mm. you was traded. And that, that was how I found out I was traded. But Pat Riley ended up calling me, like, shortly after that and just told me, like, it's a business, yeah. you understand it? And that was my introduction to the business of basketball. Right. But he never, like, stopped coaching me. That's the beautiful thing about you being an asset to someone, and once you're no longer able to be an asset to them, and they still coaching you, they still providing that guidance and that leadership that you still need because they take a a, a, a special, uh, they just got a special attachment to you. That's Pat Riley. Yeah, like he still was coaching me in Los Angeles. He still was coaching me when I went to Washington, when I went to Dallas. Hmm. You know, still to this day, I get text messages from Pat Riley, still coaching me through life. That's really, that's it's amazing. Yeah. Do you have a question for Karan Butler? Raise your hand right now. One of the great Hoop Hall staffers will put you in line mm-hmm. to our right, your left. Let's talk about Washington because that Washington team was clearly built around you and Gilbert and Anton Jameson. Gilbert Arenas, Karan Butler, Anton Jameson. That was, that was, that was big three. Yeah, it was, it was special. We, we, we had three guys that can literally go out there and score 69 to 72 points a night. Mm-hmm. And everybody else just filled in the chips and, you know, did the little things. But, you know, Gilbert Arenas was averaging 30 a night. I was averaging 20. Antoine was averaging 20. It was just an amazing team to be a part of. Was that something that, that needed to be said when y'all got in the, in the locker room for the first time? Like, here we go, this is, or, or did, you, did you just look across the locker room? I mean, you see Agent Zero, you see Anton Jamison, you see Karan Butler. You knew that those three got it. The rest of the dudes just got to chip in something else. Yeah, it, it, it kind of just organically happened. You yeah. know, we didn't know that we was on coexist like that together. We just yeah. started playing and... Antoine was a pick and pop guy. Gilbert was a guy that had the ball that can do anything. Mm. You know, he was a superstar. And then I was an isolation player playing from 17 on in. So that was my game. And we all just complimented one another. Now, in 2011, you get your ring yeah. with the Dallas Mavericks. Um, unfortunately, I think it was January that year you got injured. Went down. So let me ask. I mean, that is the lo- resume line that mm. very few people get. NBA champion. How much did it really destroy you? that you had to, the la- you helped, the, I mean, that, that team was your mm-hmm. team. But to have to watch that final series and to not be on the court against the Miami Heat of all teams. It was crazy because going through that season, we was like, we had the number one record. I was the second leading scorer on the team. Mm-hmm. And then I go down in January and I get injured. And the second that, you know, things like that happen, people, you know, tuck their tail in. And they're just like, all right, I, I quit, I give in. But the thing about my adversity that I went through in life early on taught me is that, look, I got to find another way to be an asset to this team. You know, I can be eyes in the locker room. I can talk to my, my brothers, my teammates, like coach can't talk to them. I yeah. could tell them things that I see that coach probably wouldn't understand or couldn't see at the time. So I just found a way to have my sweat equity still in. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then I, I humbled myself as I was injured, but I let them see me that, and I, watched, I let them watch me grind back, grind back every day and just get back into playing shape and back out there on the court. So it was kind of like I was providing inspiration for them, but they was my inspiration. They was the carrot that had me kept going. And that's interesting which, because it leads me to my next question, which is even though you have stops after that in you know, OKC and Detroit, back in L.A. with the Clippers, Milwaukee, it strikes me that around that point in your career, you start realizing that your contributions don't always have to be stat sheet contributions. Yeah. That's, I mean, since then, you've, you've become one of the great media figures in our game. Um, your ownership in the global mixed gender basketball um, opportunities and leagues have popped up. So I'm curious about, of all these, the contributions away from the court, you're an author. Of all the contributions away from the court, which have been the most surprisingly fulfilling for you? 
<laughs> That's crazy. Like the the second the second that I used the book and that platform as therapy to vent out, mm -hmm. it seemed like everything in my life just really changed. You know, like the the young guys in the association from Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, all the guys that I play with, like they like, yo, you're the you're the big homie now. You the you you the OG. Yeah. So you, now you're giving them the insight and the information to for them to be a better version of themselves. So immediately when that project happened, going forward, I, I I look at things totally different. Like I'm trying to just help people be a better version of themselves, and I, I'm basically coaching from within and you know from a distance, and kind of like what Coach Calhoun and Pat Riley and all those guys provided for me, I'm trying to do that and provide for them. And the book, once again, Tough Juice. It's, it's something you need to be ordering tonight. Um, my final question for you involves something that you've hinted at. You know, your first time here in the Hall of Fame, and here we are underneath so many faces of so many who have come before, so many who are still contributing like you to the game. What is this particular moment getting ready for yet another NBA season but off the court? What is this moment right here feel like to Karan Butler all these years later? It's, it's, it's amazing. And it's hard to put in words because when you come in here, as I, as I touched on, you know, prior to us starting this interview, you're touched by so many of these people that you've been connected to. And then so many people that, you know, gave you a wealth of, you know, knowledge and this influence and perspective on life in it, on the sport. And you just don't want to let them down. You know, you want to continue to inspire. You want to continue to go out there and, and be a better version of yourself. And also, you know, just the expectations on this upcoming season. You know, there's so many things to be excited about. DeMarcus Cousins in, in, with the Warriors. You know, uh, where Carmelo Anthony's going to go and how is DeMar DeRozan going to fare with the San Antonio Spurs? Uh, is it Pop's system that make guys great? Or was it Tim Duncan and you know, Kawhi Leonard and Tony Parker and those guys. There's so many questions in the association, and um, I get to help tell those stories. So the, I'm, I'm happy to be on this side of the field, and I'm looking forward to the season. Ladies and gentlemen, Karan Butler. Yeah, thank you. So I warned you ahead of time. These are the hard questions coming up. These are the hard ones. I've been I've been softballing the whole time. So uh, <laughs> let's let's get to the uh, to, to the fan questions. I only have. Two requests is when you ask a question, you allow me to hold the microphone and you introduce yourself to Mr. Butler before you ask. Hi, my name is Eze, E-Z-E. -E. Um, my question is, have you ever got re blocked really hard by someone? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> have ever got, so, so early in my career, I was dunking and doing all that. But, you know, as I got older, probably about seven, eight years in, you know, those dunks became into like real nice finesse layups. And that's when people start sending it every once in a while. So I just, I stuck to the corner jump shots and that's how I was able to sustain and stick around for some time. Which, which I gotta add, I don't know how LeBron is still flying and dunking 15 years in. Like, it's a joke, but that, it's crazy. Okay, eight years in, I'm telling you, I thought I was special. I thought I was different. Them dunks was hard layups. LeBron is still dunk, jumping higher. He looks better than he ever looked. I seen him like three days ago. I was just like, bro, it looked like you about to win the MVP this year. 16 years, he's about to win the MVP. I'm calling it. LeBron's going to win the MVP this year. Hands down. Thank you, Eze. Appreciate it. I like that. Six, yeah. 16 years in. And I'm going to tell you my story behind it because you look at the Los Angeles Lakers, right? Five years, they have not been to the playoffs. So what is going to be the headline in the story all season long? We know what, we know what the Warriors are going to do, right? They're going to give you that action. But the Lakers never been to the playoffs in five, five years since the Kobe Achilles injury and the Dwight Howard being there on the team. So now, LeBron James comes to the Lakers. They're going to be a 4-5 seed in the Western Conference. Playoffs. MVP. He's going to average 26-plus. Six rebounds. Five assists. He's in the biggest market. 
Yeah. MVP. It's all right to give him the MVP again because he's in a different market now. We get a couple years where it's okay to love him again. I'm just putting it out there. Y'all heard it here first. I'm I telling like you. I like that, Karan. Go ahead. Hey, bud. Hello, my name is Devon Aline, and my question is, what did it take you to, what did it take to, for you to make it to the NBA? That's a great question. What did it take for me to make it to the NBA? I would have to say determination, dedication, and discipline. And, you know, policing myself. Policing myself from what everybody else was doing, right? So if you want to be the 1%, you can't do what the 99% is doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, if they're going to, you know, shoot for an hour, mm -hmm. you got to shoot for two hours. The more you put in the bank, the more you'll be able to withdraw. Okay. And I try to do more than everybody. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. That's an excellent question, buddy. Hey, bud. Um, my name is Ben. How you doing? Good. What's your question? Um, what's your favorite team when you were little? What was my favorite team when I was little? The Chicago Bulls. Because okay. of that man right there. Michael Jordan, the greatest player ever to play the game of basketball in my eyes. I'm from uh, the Milwaukee area. We had WGN, and we got all the Chicago Bulls games, and Jordan was just ridiculous. Thank Every you. night, amazing. Thank you. You're who's welcome. Your, who's your favorite uh, team, Ben? The Mavericks. The Mavericks, That's hey. a good call right, right there. All right, here we are. Yeah. Great, Ben. Thank you so much, buddy. Great question. If I had to bet my bottom dollar on that, I would have said he wasn't going to say the Warriors. I, me too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? I'm um, Harry. So two-part question. The first, what got you addicted to chewing the straws, and how hard was it to quit? So if you don't know the story, I, I, my grandfather always had a toothpick in his mouth when he was working on the cars. He was a mechanic. So I used to see him always with a toothpick in his mouth. I, I swear, I, th I think he slept with one in his mouth. So me, as a kid, you know, I used to poke myself with the toothpick trying to be like him, so I started chewing on straws all the time. And that's what got me addicted, just like seeing him do it all the time. I wanted to do it. And um, it was good for my nerves, too, because playing in front of, you know, thousands of people, not understanding that millions is watching, it just like, it was kind of something that just like, okay, you're okay. Yeah. All right, go to work. And that, it helped me out a lot. All right, no doubt. Thanks. Appreciate Great. it. Thanks, Harry. Is the Mountain Dew addiction thing a real thing, too? Yeah, it was, it was bad. It was, <laughs> I wasn't sure. I used to drink a two liter of Mountain Dew before every game. That makes halftime real important. Man. <laughs> and when I crashed, I crashed. <laughs> hey, Karan, I'm How Brian. How you doing? Hey, good. Um, I've been a fan since you used to beat on him. Oh. The day. So, but I was going to ask you, you played with a lot of guys. Um, maybe talk about your favorite teammate and why that was your favorite teammate. That's a great question. Um, so listen, I got a list. Of, I want to acknowledge all of them because, you know, we live in a social media world now. So if you don't show people they you know, pay homage, they'd be like, hey, man, I thought I was your favorite teammate too. So let me go down the list. So Dwayne Wade, Eddie Jones, Gilbert Arenas, Antoine Jameson, Dirk, Jason Kidd, Jason Terry, uh, Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, Blake Griffin, Chris Paul, DeMarcus Cousins, Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant was my favorite teammate and my guy just because when I went to the Lakers, like I told you, I got traded. And I was, you know, introduced to this business at a young age. And I'm like, man, how do I do this? How do that? You know, Pat Riley was so great for me. All the things that I was being coached and talked about, about being a professional, preparation, film, and being showed, I saw it firsthand with Kobe Bryant. I saw his attention to detail, which he, he does detail now on ESPN Plus, I, on the app. I saw all the things firsthand. I saw a guy say, I, I literally saw him walk in a, a locker room and do this to Andre Iguodala, for the record. I'm going to score 50 on you tonight <laughs> and score 52. <laughs> like, so when I seen that firsthand, it, it taught me a lot about preparation and skill set and this mindset and everything. By far, the best teammate I had. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Brian. Hey, Bobby. 
Good to see you. Represent. I see the heat. Bobby Ramos. That's right. Heat. That's <laughs> why I did that. Um, talk about, you know, especially in today's world with so much animosity between the African-American community and police officers, talk about how when you were wild and out in your young days, a police officer had your back and your friends to this day. Yeah. So that's a, that's a great point. Uh, I, me, me and Sergeant Geller was just talking this morning, you know, prior to me coming over here because uh, our film is uh, just about to get greenlit this November, December, January. We'll be filming in Detroit, Atlanta, and Wisconsin. And this is a guy, Sergeant Geller, Rick Geller, saved my life. You know, I was headed down the wrong path and uh, I was in a drug raid. And he was one of the, the, the police officers that came in with the ATF unit, alcohol, tobacco, and firearm. And he had a decision to make. They found some paraphernalia, they found things in the house, and he had a decision to make on this, on this day. And he chose not to charge me with what they found in the house. And that's just, that's mind blowing because we all know today, if you're in the car and they see a, a, anything of weapon of choice, you name it, what, what's happening with the individual? They're going to jail. If you have any priors, and just to piggyback on what I just said, if I had went to jail that day with my priors that I had, I would have got 15 years to life. 15 years to life, and it was a decision, uh, an educated decision by Rick Geller that day that afforded me this opportunity to be right here talking to you. Thanks, Karan. Thanks, yeah. Bob. Thanks, Bobby. And we're bringing in the closer. This is a fresh arm here. Going to throw some heat uh -oh. at the last inning. Hey, uh, Matt, uh, I've seen you comment Kevin Durant and LeBron were some of the harder players for you to guard. I was wondering who's someone that maybe not everyone would think was uh, someone hard for you to guard? Oh, that's a great question, too. Um, I, I, one of the guys, he's playing, I think he's playing now in the big three, if anybody watched that, uh, Bonzi Wells. Yeah. Listen, Bonzi was a problem. <laughs> it was like he was built like a, just, just solid. You can't move him, SpongeBob body, <laughs> like this a box, this solid. But you know, once he gets in the post, he got a wide frame. You know, he knew how to use his body and angles to just, you know, get, carve out space and get enough space and real estate to get his shots off. You know, it wasn't a, a prolific score or anything like that, but he was just, he was just tough to guard. Like, he just beat you up on offense. He's like one of the few guys i ever seen beat you up on offense. Like, slap you, psh, psh, all, just everything. Yo, he's a tough cover. Yeah. Thank you so much. Man. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one final 60 days of summer. Thank you. Round of applause for Mr. Karan Butler. Appreciate you. Thank you. Now the fun part. Karan is going to be moving over to the autograph table. So if you want to get in line, the great Hoop Hall staffers will put you...